بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so إن شاء الله today we will finish up the accomplishments of uh, Uthman رضي الله عنه and then next week we will begin the rather difficult and awkward portion uh, regarding uh, the beginning of the end of the uh, glorious reign of the first 20 years of Islam and uh, talk about the death of Uthman and the assassination of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala and the beginning of the fitna that took place in the early Muslim ummah. That will be next week. Today, inshallah ta'ala, is still the positive. We're still uh, basically sailing from the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab and all of these conquests are taking place. So today we'll briefly summarize the main accomplishments of Uthman radiallahu an militarily and inshallah ta'ala as well his greatest achievement for the ummah, the biggest blessing that he gave the ummah, and that is the Uthmanic Mus'haf. So we begin with the political conquest of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an. And as I had mentioned last time, it is well known that the first six years of the Khilaf of Uthman, Uthman ruled for 12 years, the first six years were a continuation of the glory years of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. And the conquest continued in each and every direction. North and East and West. There is no South of Arabia. North, East and West. So in the East, in the East, the main conquests that took place were the complete collapse finally of the Sassanid or the Persian Empire. And there was a full assault on what is now Azerbaijan in the year 24 AH. Now, Today's lecture is not going to be all the details of the battles. Really, that is not something that most Muslims find interesting. What happened in each battle and whatnot. I'm just going to overall talk about these geographic regions. Realize that the Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire, was divided into many provinces, many, many kingdoms. And the empires of old did not have the type of control that, let's say, the modern country of America has over its states. Rather, there was one major empire and then there were many kingdoms that would give nominal allegiance. They would give small amount of tax and there would be some type of loyalty given. So consider it a type of loose federal states. And frankly, the Muslim ummah was the same. The Abbasid Khilafah did not actually control and micromanage each and every promise, province. It would be too much. Rather, each province has its own kingdom, but it's not quite a kingdom. It's governorship kingdom. Each province has its own rulers, which are hereditary, but they are nominally under the Abbasids or the Umayyads or the Ottomans. So the same is happening in the Persian Empire. So with the collapse of the Persian king, that doesn't mean the mini dynasties are all going to join the Muslim Ummah. Rather, these mini dynasties want to fight back. And that's what the Khilaf of Uthman saw. That each one of these small dynasties, each one of these mini kingdoms, technically they're not an independent kingdom. Technically they are provinces that are ruled by the Sassanid Empire. But when the Sassanid Empire collapses, these provinces don't want to be ruled by the Muslim. So each one of them engages in war against the Muslim Ummah as the Muslim Ummah continues on forth. And Azerbaijan uh, at this time was predominantly uh, Christian, unlike the Sassanids who were Zoroastrian. And uh, Azerbaijan, uh, there was a lot of back and forth between uh, the Muslims and between the Azerbaijani uh, forces. And the Muslims had to call for reinforcements multiple times. And eventually, the famous Sahabi Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais uh, finally conquered uh, the entire region of Azerbaijan. And he decided to help ease the conversion process. Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, by the way, is a famous Sahabi who also has some royalty in his blood because his ancestors were the kings of Yemen. So he is a well-known companion because he was in effect a prince who converted to Islam, Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. And uh, he became eventually uh, the, the governor and the ruler of this region. At this point in time, he's still conquering the region. And he decides to facilitate conversion. So he said that the Azerbaijani population is rebelling too much. So he decided to send hundreds of Islamic scholars, du'at, Qurra of the Qur'an to settle in the lands and to preach Islam and slowly but surely the people began to embrace Islam bit by bit until today, alhamdulillah, the majority of that region is indeed Muslim. Today, 95% of the region is Muslim. 5% are still Orthodox Christian, by the way. So again, all of this shows us that Muslims never force their religion on the people. If they did, we wouldn't have still minorities remaining. As, we, as I said many times, the Coptics 
the Coptics of Egypt are still 10%. 10% is a huge amount. One out of every 10 Egyptians is still following the religion of pre-Islam. If Muslims forced their religion down the Azerbaijanis, down the Egyptians, there would not be any other religion. So slowly but surely the people of Azerbaijan uh, converted uh, until, as I said today, there are around 95% of the people are uh, are Muslim, by the way, FYI. So obviously a lot of things happen in the meantime. Uh, of the things that happened in Azerbaijan is that they came under the rule of Iran in the 1500s. And Iran in the 1500s was ruled by the Safavids. And the Safavids were a Shi'i dynasty. This is something that all of you should be uh, aware of. If you do not know it, then learn it. It is a very important fact of our history. Iran was historically the backbone of Sunni Islam. Some of the greatest ulama of our tradition came from Iran, including Imam al-Bukhari, including Imam Muslim, including Imam Tirmidhi, including Imam Ghazali is Iranian. Imam Ghazali spoke Persian better than he spoke Arabic, right? So one of the most prominent Sunni theologians, Imam al-Ghazali, is Iranian by blood, by ethnicity, by language. And so many, uh, I mean, the father of the Arabic language, Sibaway, is Iranian, believe it or not. Sibaway, who is considered to be the founder of Arabic grammar, who literally sat down and qa'ad al qawaid he wrote and he figured out he's Iranian. So Iran was always a bastion of Sunni Islam. What happened? How is it now the only Shi'i state? This goes back to one incident in history, and that is the Safavid Empire. The Safavid Empire. The Safavid Empire came uh, into power in the 1500s. Ismail al-Safavi, who himself was a Sunni, and he wanted to break away from uh, the Ottomans and the other Sunni empires. And uh, as we know, in Sunni Islam, technically there should be only one Khilafah. Technically, theoretically, there should be one Khilafah. So Ismail al-Safavi did not want to be under the, uh, the uh, Sunni Khalifa. So he converted himself. He was Sunni background. He converted to... 12-er Shi'ism. And then he began a brutal reign of forcing the people of Iran to convert to Shi'i Islam. Okay? And for the next hundred years or so, I'm being very simplistic here, and just, just so that we get back to Azerbaijan, for the next hundred years or so, there was a brutal campaign launched to eliminate Sunni ulama, to eliminate Sunni madaris, to give incentive to those who converted to 12-er uh, Shi'ism, to build establishments and seminaries of 12-er Shi'ism, to cause the khutbas to be delivered only by the 12-er Shi'i and to eliminate. So bit by bit, slowly but surely, the population continued to basically convert to and forced to convert. There was, of course, killings. There was, of course, assassinations, executions, imprisonment, and there was bribes at the same time to convert. Lots of things took place at this point in time. Well known. I'm not making this up. Go look this up yourself. Iran was never associated with Shi'ism for the first 800 years. It had nothing to do with Shi'ism. Shi'ism was always an Iraqi phenomenon. It was a Kufan phenomenon. From the very beginning, Shi'ism was Iraqi. Always. Iran is very recent in human history, only a few, 300, 400 years ago. So the Safavids came to power, they converted Iran. By the way, to, to this day, it is said, nobody knows statistics because the government doesn't publish these, it is said that still 20% of Iran is Sunni. 20%, it is said. They are not the ones in power, they are not the ones in government, they're not the ones in Tehran. Typically, most, uh, m the, most of them are in other provinces. So it wasn't full conversion. And there's still tensions, obviously, between the Sunni and the Shia in Iran itself, by the way. And I have Sunni friends. Now, again, this is very controversial. Uh, people get very emotional about this. Allah knows best. I've never visited Iran. I have plenty of friends uh, that are Sunni from Iran that have told me horror stories from their side. And when I speak to the uh, Shia of Iran, they say, no, no, this is all a lie. They, we have public masajid that are Sunni. And I have never been, I don't know myself, but I have heard stories from both sides. How is this relevant? So Azerbaijan was under the Safavid Empire. And therefore, Azerbaijan, which was a Sunni land, itself was forced to be converted. Okay, in the 1550s to the 1600s, 1650s. It was forced to be converted until the majority of Azerbaijan currently is Shi'i. So one of the very few countries in the world where the majority are Shi'a is Azerbaijan. So 85% of the Muslims are Shi'i. 
and 15% are Sunni. And very interestingly as well, in Azerbaijan, there are small pockets of Ismaili Shia, seven or Shia to this day, right? To this day, there are small pockets of seven or Ismaili Shia from the days of the Fatimid Empire. The Fatimids sent uh, their callers, their preachers, their, their du'at, and there are pockets of tribes in Azerbaijan that are still following the da'wah of the Fatimid Empire because it was cut off from the rest of society. So we still have entire tribes that are still following Sevener, Batani, Ismaili, Shi'ism, but these are small pockets. The majority of Azerbaijanis are 12er, 15% are Sunni. All of them have been influenced by the modern Russian Republic, the 95 years of forced secularism, forced communism, forced atheism, and so Islam is very weak anyway, Sunni or Shia. The Muslims themselves are rediscovering their identity because, as we know, for 90 plus years, the Russians did not allow, uh, of course, Azerbaijan was under Russia uh, up until um, uh, Gorbachev's era. So uh, Azerbaijan is now simply coming out. But of course, the current rulers of all of these regions are repressing their peoples. And there's a big tension and battle in every one of these republics, every one of the Russian republics, from Azerbaijan to uh, Turkestan to uh, Kyrgyzstan to all Dagestan, all of these Istan countries, we're going to talk about some of them today, they're facing a lot of tensions between the governments and the peoples about the role of religion, how Muslim should... How much Muslim should we be? How much Islamic activism is allowed? All of this is now undergoing a lot of tension. For our purposes, Azerbaijan is conquered in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. The Muslims then go on to the next region. Uh, it's called Tabaristan. And again, Tabaristan is a modern province in Iran. Uh, and this province as well remained non-Muslim for many, many decades until finally in the time of the Abbasids, uh, they converted to Islam. This is also the first era in the time of Uthman ibn Affan, that the Muslims engaged with the group that is called the Turks. The Turks. Now, this is an interesting point as well. The Turks technically are not from Turkey. The Turks are not from this land that is called Turkey. The Turks are actually related to the Russians, the Circassians. The Turks are related to the Russians, and they are from the steppes of Russia, from the Caucasus Mountains, from that region. And they are not from the land of Turkey. Obviously, if, obviously, because Turkey was conquered by the Muslims, by the Turks. They weren't there before they conquered it, right? Ethnically, they go back many, many centuries ago, a thousand years ago, to what are now the Russian steppes, okay? And they are related ethnically, biologically, to the, Cauc the, the Caucasus people, the Russians. And the Muslims engage with the Turks for the very first time. Now, just pause here, footnote. There are a number of ahadith in our traditions that mention the Prophet warning us from fighting the Turks. Okay, these ahadith are mentioned in Abu Dawood and Imam Ahmad Musnad and Nasa'i. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Leave the Turks alone as long as they leave you alone. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Right? And the reason for this, according to these ahadith, is that when you engage them, eventually they will take over you and they will become your rulers. Now, that is exactly what happened. That as we know, the Khilafah was taken away from the Abbasids and taken uh, by the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks are one branch of Turks. That's why they're called Uthmaniyun. The Ottoman Turks, you had the Seljuk Turks. You have various branches of the Turk tribes. And the Ottoman Turks eventually became the, Khali uh, the Khulafah, uh, the, the representing the Muslim Ummah. So the first time the Muslims engaged with the Turks and this group of Turks are called the, the Khazars, the Khazars. And this is the region of what is now Dagestan, Dagestan. And the Khazars were another mighty proud dynasty. And again, the Muslims engaged with them back and forth. And to this day, not all of them are Muslim. These regions are not 100% Muslim. This region is around 80% Muslim and still 20% remain on uh, the ancient religion. Some of them are still on the ancient religions, pre-Islam. Many, most of them are Christians, and there are even other uh, Mazdaeans and other very small religious groups over there. So the point is one after the other. I'm not going to go over every battle. As I said, I skipped over this. Just know that the major provinces of this region, the major cities, Faryab, Juzjan, uh, uh, Tabaristan, Tukharistan, all of these that are now, in essence, provinces in Iran and Afghanistan and the 
federated, uh, the, the freed Russian republics. This entire region is now being conquered in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. So in summary, the eastern conquests, in essence, the Sassanid Empire collapses and the mini dynasties or the mini provinces attempt to fight the Muslims. But each one is now independent. They're not going to rely on the big guys, the Sassanids. And each one is busy with its own defense, so it's only a matter of time before the entire empire is absorbed by the Muslim Ummah, and there is no remnant whatsoever of the power and the glory of the Persian Empire. And I already told you some weeks ago about the death of Yazdajar III, the final uh, Sassanid Empire, and this is in the reign of Uthman. I gave you the story then because I, I wanted to just talk about the, the conquest of uh, uh, the Sassan Empire uh, and remember that he fled from his castle and he became a he disguised himself and he just entered a strange town without telling anybody who he was and he asked shelter from the baker the miller and the miller didn't know who he was and the miller was an evil person he kills him in his own house steals his stuff and he opens the bag and he finds the crown of Yazdajart so a baker, a flower person, you know, ones who does the bakery, that's the person who killed Yazdajad the third. What an uh, ignoble, uh, inglorious death at the hands of the last tyrant of the Sassanid. This took place in the reign of Uthman. This takes place in the reign of Uthman ibn Affan. So, in essence, in the reign of Uthman, the entire region uh, of the what is now the Russian republics is conquered. In the north, going up north, what happens in the north? Well, in the north, not much conquest took place because Umar had already done all of it. The land of Asham, Syria. In essence, it has been conquered. But what happens is that the Romans launch an offensive to regain control over certain key provinces. And they successfully take it back from the Muslims in the early time of Uthman ibn Affan. So in the time of Uthman, those lands are reconquered. Not for the first time, for the second time. Okay, so Uthman ibn Affan then goes and reconquers a series of cities and provinces in uh, Syria, and not that much more is gained than what was gained in the time of Umar. The difference, though, is that this is now solidified. The borders are now fortified. So now the Muslims have complete control. But the main success against the Byzantine Empire was the small island of Qubrus, Cyprus. That is the main success that took place in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. Now, Cyprus had always been, a, has always been, still to this day, a very key uh, island. It's a very important island because, in essence, whoever controls Cyprus controls the passageways around it. In the modern world that we live in, you have Greece on one side, Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel, all of these countries are basically less than 100 miles from this little key island of Cyprus. So whoever has access to Cyprus has access to the water routes, can get supplies for the ships, can dock their ships, and basically is very strategically important. And it is still strategically important to this day. And Muawiyah, the military commander, and he was no doubt a politician of the highest order. He was definitely, yani, uh, siyasa ran in his blood. There's no doubt about it. There's nothing, there's nothing negative about that. He's coming from uh, a background of a politician, and he knows how to rule. Even as a young man, when Umar ibn Khattab appoints him the governor of Syria in his 20s, Muawiyah was appointed by Umar as the governor of Syria. In his 20s, Muawiyah writes a letter. He wants to conquer Cyprus. He wants to go and conquer. Why? Because Muawiyah realized one of our biggest weaknesses was that we don't have a naval force. One of the biggest strengths of the Byzantine Empire is that they can send massive amounts of troops, of supplies via water. And we, how are we going to send our troops and supplies? Desert. Land. Right? And of course, when you're going via water, you can go faster, you can have larger surprise, uh, uh, supplies, and you land refreshed. Well, relatively refreshed. You're not walking in the desert. You're sitting in a cabin for two weeks, and then you come and you're ready to fight. Unlike if you're coming from a city, you're walking for weeks or days on end, then you have to engage in battle. So Muawiyah always felt that the ummah needed a naval force. So he wrote a letter to Umar ibn Khattab. He writes a letter to Umar ibn Khattab, and he says, O Amir al-Munin, we need a naval force. Help or please finance, allow me permission to finance, and we will attack the Byzantine Empire. 
Now, the Arabs, the pre-Islamic Arabs, and then also the Sahaba themselves, because they are coming from that generation, understandably, they are people of the land and the desert. And they had a fear of the ocean, a type of, of, of mistrust of riding on the waves. And it's understandable. And so Umar ibn Khattab wrote a letter to uh, Amr ibn al-As, and Awad ibn al-As was one of the most well-traveled of the Sahaba. He had been on ships many times. Remember, he's the one who went to negotiate with, uh, with who? With Najashi. He's been to the Byzantine Empire many times. He's traded with the Romans, with the Persians. Amr ibn al-As is well-traveled, and he's been on ships many times. So he writes a letter to Amr ibn al-As. And he says, what do you think? Should we, should we build our own ships? Should we have a naval force? And Amr ibn al-As writes a very, very scary letter back. The Arabic is in fact very powerful, somewhat eloquent, but it's very terrifying. Uh, and in, I've just translated bits and phrases of it. Uh, he says that I have experienced small creatures riding massive structures, people riding massive ships, like worms on a log. Worms on a log. Okay, If the ship goes forward, the heart is rendered asundered. If the ship goes right and left, the mind goes crazy. And he goes on and on. Like he's terrified. Like being on a ship, it's something that is absolutely terrifying. And he describes in vivid detail the dangers of riding on a ship. Okay. Now of course, Umar radiallahu anh, and others, many of them, have never really been on long uh, journeys. Uh, and in fact, Umar did not even immigrate to Habasha. Okay, so he hasn't even been to the smallest. Now, even Habasha, by the way, is what? It's literally from Jeddah to Habasha. is literally just a, a one, one journey away. Even that he hasn't done. So Amr ibn al-As sends back his letter. He basically says, this is not a good idea. And so Umar ibn al-Khattab writes back to Muawiyah. And he says, the life of one Muslim is more precious to me than all the lands of the Romans. Do not start a naval force. Do not start a naval expedition. We don't want any ships. So, Muawiyah has to listen. Umar dies. Now Muawiyah's cousin, Uthman, is in power. And he then writes a letter to Uthman. And he says, we need to have a naval force. Uthman writes back, I was there when Umar wrote that letter to you. Don't bring it up again. Okay? Don't tell me. I know, you already tried this. Okay? I was there. Umar made mashwara with us. We know what Umar said. But Uthman is not like Umar in his, in his strength of, or not, in his strictness, I wanted to say. And Muawiyah is very close to Uthman because they are from the same tribe. They are second cousins. And so Muawiyah writes another letter pleading with Uthman, telling him the benefits of the naval, uh, uh, the, the importance of having a, a naval fleet. And begging him or pleading with him that we need to do this in order to... Because especially Cyprus, so the Byzantine uh, Empire would send its ships from what is now Europe. And they would rest at Cyprus, get the water supplies, get the fruits that needed, get the food, and then go and attack the Muslims for defense. So Cyprus needed to be eliminated. He wanted to control Cyprus. So he begs Uthman... Allow me a permission, I need to go and, and conquer this island. So Uthman then responds back, and he basically gives in, but he, but he uh, puts some conditions. He says, only if you take your wife with you, then I will allow you to go. Can anybody explain this condition? He wants to make sure that it's safe. Like, if you are that confident, then take your wife with you. Like, what an amazing condition, right? Like, are you that confident that it's, the ship is going to be... And now again, and subhanAllah, and this is a very sensitive topic. Some Muslims really, uh, you know, misunderstand and misconstruct. And wallahi, there's nothing that is, astaghfirullah, derogatory or putting the sahaba on. But they were human beings. And the fears that they had are understandable. The sahaba are not divine. They are human beings. And Umar ibn Khattab felt that a naval force is not a good idea. That's his ijtihad. And we love and respect him even if we don't have to agree with each and every ijtihad. And he was the greatest a billion times better than all of us combined. But that doesn't mean every ijtihad of his was 
absolutely 100% correct. He made an ishtihad. And who cares whether it was right or wrong? He is Umar bin Khattab. But he's a human being. Uthman as well made an ishtihad and Muawiyah convinced him otherwise. And we now, obviously, hindsight's 2020. Of course you need a naval force. How can you have uh, an empire without having a naval force, right? But this hesitation of the Sahaba, and again, I mean, some Muslims are very sensitive when it gets to the issue of anyhow disagreeing with the Sahaba. No, the Sahaba are human beings. Yes, they are radiallahu anhum, and they are the best of the best. There's no question. This does not mean that every one of their political decisions or military decisions is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are human beings. And they make mistakes like the humans of their times. So Umar ibn Khattab did not want an, a naval force. It didn't happen in his lifetime. Uthman initially didn't want it. Muawiyah convinces him. And even then he puts conditions. Take your wife with you. Make sure there are women on the ship that you can trust. Therefore, that the ship is, gonna be, is going to be uh, safe. And he also says that nobody should be forced to go. Nobody should be told to go. You should not draw lots for the people on the ship. It must be volunteer based. Now again, there is this terrifying paranoia on the on the on the from the pre-Islamic Arabs about riding in ships. We understand it. We understand it. It's completely, you know, nothing is. But it's not the way forward for a civilization. So, Alhamdulillah, eventually. Muawiyah's, uh, uh, and, and this is one of the greatest credits to Muawiyah radiallahu an. One of the greatest credits to Muawiyah radiallahu an, forward thinking. He understands that you need to have changes. And this isn't going to be the only major change that he does. He has some very uh, major changes he does to restructure the, the course of Islamic civilization. So uh, of the conditions that Uthman places as well is that people have to go voluntarily. You cannot force the people to go or assign them to go. You must tell them the stakes that you're going on a ship. And they have to sign up on their own free accord. And so Muawiyah radiallahu an, uh, agrees to this condition. And uh, he wrote to uh, the port town of uh, Akka, which is now Acre in the country of Israel. Uh, he wrote to the port town of Akka. And uh, he commanded the, uh, the uh, Muslims there to get the help of the locals to build an entire military expedition. Sorry, a naval expedition. Uh, force, a naval expedition. This is the first time ever that the Muslims are building ships. The first time ever. The Muslims are building ships, but of course with the help of the local population. And again, this shows the forward thinkingness of the Muslims. They didn't care. The Muslims don't know how to build ships. That's not their domain. And subhanAllah, a few hundred years later, and the Muslims will be the world experts in shipbuilding. And even Christopher Columbus will need the help of the descendants of the Muslims and the descendants of the Arabs to build ships and to navigate them. SubhanAllah, how things are going to change. Right now, they don't know. But they're open-minded enough to take the help of the best people who know. And they have a naval expedition and prepare to invade uh, Cyprus. Cyprus, of course, is very close to the, the coast of Syria. It's literally less than 50 miles off the coast of Syria. By the way, still, that's why some Syrian refugees are attempting to flee to Cyprus. But of course, political conditions there, the Cypriots don't want them. So that's why they're preventing them from coming, and they're not giving citizenship, unlike uh, the Greek islands, which are giving EU passes, which is why the Syrians are wanting to go to uh, the EU, um, uh, the, the islands, the Greek, the Greek islands. But uh, Cyprus is physically closer, but politically, they don't have the same uh, privileges. So therefore, the, the refugees are not that enthused to go to Cyprus. Nonetheless, there has also been waves of refugees to uh, Cyprus as well. In any case, back to our point here. So... Muawiyah announces he's going to have a military campaign against the Byzantine Empire and against the uh, province of Cyprus. Now, the Cypriots were indeed under the Byzantine Empire, but they were not pure. Again, these are mini dynasties, slight differences in ethnicity and language. And to this day, the Cypriots speak a slightly different accent and language than people on the mainland. To this day, there is that distinction. And even then, there was... There was not, it's not as if these are the pure Byzantines living on the island of Cyprus. There are tensions. There are their own mini kingdom that they have. And they have not full independence. They're under the, the Byzantine Empire. But they have basically somewhat of an independence. And they have a relationship with the Byzantine Empire. So Muawiyah announces he's going to basically uh, engage with uh, Cyprus. And a number of prominent Sahaba agreed to join the expedition. 
Of course, Muawiyah is leading it, and he has to take his wife along. And his wife is Fakha binti Qurada, uh, and he takes his wife along because Uthman mandated you have to take your wife along. Along with Muawiyah, we also have Ubadah ibn Samit, and Ubadah ibn Samit also took his wife, Umm Haram binti Milhan. And we have Abu Ayyub al Ansari and Abu Darda, and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, and Shaddad ibn Aws, and another dozen or so Sahaba. So we have around a dozen of the Sahaba who physically landed in Cyprus. And wallahi, unfortunately, we don't have any of the details of what happened uh, to each one of these Sahaba other than Umm uh, Milhan, as we will mention, Umm uh, um Haram bin Milhan. But wallahi, just imagine you have Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the host of the Prophet Wasallam. You have him landing in Cyprus, seeing the Greek structures over there, walking on the very land that is considered to be one of the main provinces of the Roman Empire. I mean, wallahi, mind-boggling how quickly things are changing. Some of the very people who are starving in Medina because there's no food, who are surrounded by the Quraysh not even knowing what's going to happen, some of them participated in Badr and Uhud. Now we have them walking on the lands of literally Byzantine soil. Wallahi, from where to where, mind-boggling. This is yani, the, the, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, here we have to pause and give the famous story of Umm Haram bint Milhan. Okay, that's really the main thrust or the main uh, the moral of the story, the beautiful uh, prediction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about Umm Haram. And Umm Haram is the full sister of Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas ibn Malik. So Anas ibn Malik's mother is Umm Sulaim, and Anas ibn Malik's khala is Umm Haram. Okay, so uh, Umm Haram and Umm Sulaim are sisters, and Anas ibn Malik narrates the famous hadith, it is Bukhari and Muslim, Mutafaq Ali, the famous hadith, Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet ﷺ would visit Umm Haram bint Milhan, and she would give him food. And she was married to Ubadah ibn as Samit. So one day he came and had his food, he had his lunch, and then took a nap. And Umm Haram began to uh, clear his hair from lice. Now the hadith goes on, I have to pause here. Two things. The first, how is Umm Haram touching the Prophet wasallam? Imam al nawi says, there is ijma' that Umm Haram is a mahram to the Prophet wasallam. There's ijma' that she is a mahram. But the scholars of lineage differ on how she became a mahram. How she is a mahram. So Umm Haram is a mahram. Okay. How is she a, a, a mahram? One opinion says that uh, she was his khala by foster feeding. One opinion says she was his khala by foster feeding. Okay. And another opinion says that she was the khala of his father or grandfather because Abdul Muttalib, his mother was from Banu Najjar and Umm Milhan, uh, sorry, Umm Haram was also from the Banu Najjar. Okay, so he is either his father's khala or his grandfather's khala. That's the second opinion. The first opinion, through foster feeding, he becomes the khala. So in either case, she is a full mahram of the Prophet because your father's khala is your khala, right? Or it's a type of foster, which means the same lady. And of course, in those days, there were a few tribes that were well known for feeding children, as we know from the seed of the Prophet There were a few tribes that were known for taking care of children. So however it happens, we don't know the details, it is possible that the same lady who may be fed uh, Abdullah, the father of the Prophet uh, or maybe even Amina, we don't know, we don't know, also fed Umm Haram. In either case, there is a Mahram relationship. And so the Prophet ﷺ would visit uh, uh, Umm Haram as if she is a Khala because she is Mahram. And he, uh, he would uh, take lunch with her. And at times, he would sleep in their house, siesta. They had a habit, as we know in those days, still and to this day many Arab countries, they have a habit of sleeping in the afternoon. Right? This is the siesta. And uh, the Prophet would sometimes sleep over there. So on this day as well, he went to sleep over there. So that is the first controversy. How is she touching the Prophet Clear? The second controversy, the hadith explicitly mentions that she was doing uh, yeah, falas. And falas 
means, as we all know in countries that some of us grew up in, you go through the hair and you find the you find the qumal, the, the lice, right? Now, this raises another controversy, which is even more awkward, which is what? How, how can the Prophet have qumal? Right? And this raises the very difficult subject that, again, throughout the seerah has always been somewhat source of attention. The Muslims have always idealized the Prophet ﷺ, and that's good to do. And at times that idealization makes him superhuman. At times it goes beyond what is, what is normal. So one opinion, which is the most obvious one, he eats, وسلم, he drinks, he has the same pangs and the same sicknesses that human beings do. And therefore, he will also have the same issues that other people do. And that is one interpretation of the hadith. Those who refuse to accept this, and there are many, say that the hadith sh says she was looking for lice. It doesn't say she found them. Okay. Jayid. Jayid. Okay. That's another interpretation. And frankly, it doesn't really change our aqidah either way. Uh, those who want to make some type of takalluf will follow the second position. Those who will take the obvious will follow the first position. In any case, uh, our Prophet is the best role model, but he's a human being. Simple as that. He is the greatest role model, and uh, he is qudwa, and he is imam al-mursaleen, but he is also human being, and he eats, and he drinks, and he marries, and he has children, and he falls sick, and he as well lives and dies, as all prophets do. And in the course of that, if other things happen that other people uh, happen to, and again, if you listen to my seerah, so many times we have this type of tension. Uh, if you go back to so many episodes, uh, our tasawwur of the Prophet them, our reading in, our wanting to view him in a certain way, whereas the texts seem to suggest that at least in some things we're kind of maybe reading in too much. But in any case, whichever position you want to follow, the point is, uh, Umm Haram is sitting and going through the hair of the Prophet Whether she finds something or not, it is true the hadith does not mention that. So let's move on now. So now that we've done the two awkward things, let's move on. So he is sleeping, she is uh, doing this act, and he wakes up and he smiles and laughs. So Umm Haram says, may my mother and father be sacrificed for Ya Rasulullah. Why are you laughing? What is so funny? Like what's this happiness that I see? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I saw a dream, and we know the dreams of the Prophets are true. I saw a, a, a dream that my, some of my followers were on a ghazwa, on a military expedition, on the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, riding the waves of the oceans, mulukun ala al-asirra, kings upon saddles, i.e. as if the ships become saddles. Rather than riding horses, they're riding ships. And they are controlling the ships. Mulukun ala al They are the kings upon the saddles. And Umm Haram said, Ya Rasulullah, ud'u Allah an yaj'alani minhum. Now, wallahi, this is one of the most amazing predictions. Okay? And Allah knows best. If the Prophet hadn't made dua, maybe Muawiyah wouldn't have had to do a naval force that quickly. Yani Allah is answering the dua of the Prophet ﷺ by forcing, if you like, not forcing is a harsh word, but by allowing Muawiyah to have a naval expedition to Cyprus in the lifetime of the Sahaba. Otherwise, the fact of the matter, the Muslims didn't have a powerful naval force for another hundred years. They had the beginnings. They had the beginnings. But a, a full-fledged naval force, and then for them to rule the oceans, actually that took place in the time of the Ottomans. Even the Abbasids did not have the naval force that was superior to others. It was the early Ottomans and the others that did this. So Allah knows best. In any case, when she says, O Rasulullah, make dua that Allah makes me minhum. He says, you are from them. Anti minhum, you are from them. Then he goes to sleep again. He wakes up laughing. And uh, she asks the same question. And he says that, I saw a group of my followers 
riding in expeditions to faraway lands, basically. Not the same thing. That's a, I saw another dream. So Umm Haram says, Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I'm on this group. The Prophet said, no, you're from the first group. Can't have both. You're from the first group. Okay, You're not going to be in that expedition. Wherever it was, we don't know. You are from the first uh, group. And so she volunteers to go on this expedition with her husband Ubada ibn al-Samit. And uh, subhanAllah, as soon as the ships landed in uh, Cyprus, Umm Haram was amongst the first people to walk out onto uh, the island of Cyprus. And her horse or her mule was brought out of the ship. And Allah knows best, maybe the animal wasn't feeling well after the ride, whatever. When she rides on it, the animal rears back. And she falls out and hits her head straight on uh, the rock or this, uh, the, the, the hard surface. And she passes away instantaneously. Barely coming out of the ship. And right then and there, she passes away. And uh, she dies on the spot. And today, there is a large masjid over there called Hala Sultan Tekki Masjid. It is also called the Masjid of Umm Haram. And it is near the modern city of Larnaka on the island of Cyprus. And you can find it to this day. And the Ottomans uh, built a, a very beautiful complex, which is still to this day um, somewhat similar. Unfortunately, because of, and we're not going to get into this whole Greek Turkish dispute over Cyprus that's definitely not a part of our class over here but because there's a lot of tensions you should be aware of modern issues uh, the Greeks and the Turks are in basically a lot of tension between Cyprus unfortunately the masjid has become involved in this politics as well and unfortunately some gangs have attempted to destroy the masjid they've thrown bombs onto the masjid because it's a symbol it's a symbol of the Muslim presence there. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, things have happened. But alhamdulillah, the masjid has been rebuilt and whatnot. And it's still there to this day. And uh, behind the masjid is the qabr to this day. And it is right on the shore. Literally, literally. There are pictures I wish I was, um, if I had the setup and what I would have showed you. But just Google it. The masjid of Umm Haram in Cyprus. Google it. And you will find pictures. Literally, the masjid is on the shore. Because obviously, that's where this took place. So subhanAllah, yani, to this day, the place is known. And now there is a, a masjid over there. Uh, again, sadly, for a while, the masjid was somewhat abandoned because there were no Muslims on the island because they had been expelled. But alhamdulillah, now uh, there are modern immigrants there, right? There's, there are waves of Muslims around the European world. So now there are modern Muslims there, not Muslims from descendants from ancient times, but modern immigrants from Pakistan, from Arab lands. Now they're the ones praying in this masjid, alhamdulillah. Otherwise, for a long period of time, the masjid was quite literally abandoned. Nobody's praying there. Because there are no Muslims there. So alhamdulillah, there's been a revival now. So if anybody um, does go to Cyprus, make sure that uh, you pray to that masjid and then tell us, pray in that masjid and tell us about uh, the situation of that uh, masjid. In any case, back to our invasion of the, uh, and the conquest of Cyprus. So the Muslim army lands in Cyprus and they make their way to the, uh, the, the capital of Cyprus. Cyprus is a rather large island. They make their way to the capital and surround the capital. And... Eventually, the uh, Cypriots uh, agree to surrender. They agree to surrender. So there wasn't really a major battle. The Cypriots agreed to surrender. And to be honest, it seems as if they weren't too keen on Roman rule. Remember, the Romans, the Byzantines, uh, are themselves harsh rulers. They charge excessive taxation, and they have a lot of their own dhulm that they're doing. And that's one of the main reasons why the Muslims had so much easy conquest. Even in Jerusalem, if you remember, that the Patriarch of Jerusalem appreciated the fact that he didn't have to convert to Catholicism because they weren't Catholics. They didn't have to convert to Roman Catholicism or the, it's called Melkite Christianity. So whatever the reason, the Cypriots agreed to basically surrender and they put some conditions, the Muslims put some conditions and they agreed to a treaty. For our purposes, the one main condition that we need to mention, which is going to be broken soon, the Muslims said you can never help who? The Byzantines. You cannot help the Byzantines ever. And your island can never provide them comfort and solace. Because that's the main reason for conquering. Okay? So the Cypriots agreed to this um, condition. However, four years later, the Romans attempt to attack Syria again, Bilad al-Sham. They want to reconquer what the Muslims have taken. And they land in Cyprus and the Cypriots help them. Whether willingly, whether by force, we don't know. But help and aid is given. So the treaty is broken. As soon as the Muslims deal with the Romans and kick them out, then Muawiyah sends 500 ships 
to the small little island of Cyprus. There is no way they can, they can withstand this. And completely reconquers, and yes, indeed, harshly. I mean, you need to send a message. Don't do this again. And to this day, there's a lot of bitterness from the local people there. These are stories that are well known. And frankly, this is the reality of conquering. They betrayed the treaty. They helped the Romans. Then when the Muslims reconquered, punishment was meted out. That's the reality of life in that time. They weren't treated with roses. They were treated the way that traitors are dealt with. And there was indeed uh, some destruction and bloodshed and whatnot. And eventually the Muslims reconquered uh, Cyprus completely and uh, ruled over them. Now here's an interesting point. Cyprus, unlike almost every other Muslim conquered land, was not inhabited predominantly by Muslims. Perhaps because it was an island, perhaps because it was still very early on, Cyprus by and large was not uh, engulfed by Muslim emigration. Rather, by and large, the population remained as they were, and Muslims came and went, and then to make matters even more interesting and bizarre, in 688 CE, uh, the Umayyad uh, Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, had to negotiate with the Byzantine emperor for a number of things, and the emperor put a condition that Cyprus cannot be under Muslim control because he wanted to basically have it uh, uh, out of Muslim control. So Abdul Malik ibn Marwan agreed to a neutral agreement, which was very interesting. Cyprus will neither be Muslim nor Byzantine, neither Umayyad nor Byzantine. It will be shared by the both of us, and neither of us will have the final say. Really interesting, very rare in human history has this happened, that a land has been shared by two enemies, peacefully. So the Cypriots were never taken to war. And they paid taxes for two, three hundred years, and the taxes were divided 50-50 between the Muslims and the Christians, between the Byzantines and the Umayyads. So for 300 years, Cyprus remained somewhat awkwardly independent, neither fully ruled by the Umayyads, nor fully ruled by the Byzantines. And because of this, Islam never spread completely. Because of this, Cyprus was never a direct rule of, of the Muslims. And we need to know this because unlike Andalus, unlike some other places, Malta, unlike... Um, uh, 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 Sicily, which was directly under Muslim control, Cyprus was never fully, maybe for 20, 30 years, but that's it. And even those 20, 30 years, it's not as if Islam flourished and spread. The people of the island did not convert en masse. And therefore, Islam wasn't expelled from Cyprus the way that it was expelled from Andalusia or Sicily. Cyprus has a very interesting story to it. And eventually in the 10th century, uh, the uh, Normans and the Byzantines, uh, the, the remnants of the Roman Empire, basically get rid of the treaty. Once they get rid of the treaty, there's no Muslim rule in Cyprus until the Ottomans come very recently. And that begins a whole different chapter. Okay, so we should just be aware that Cyprus has a rather interesting, atypical, I don't know of any other land the Muslims half controlled. I don't know of any other land in the early times. Cyprus was never fully under the control of the uh, Muslims. So this is on the northern side of the Byzantine Empire. On the uh, western side, what's happening on the western side? So uh, we know that uh, in the western side, Egypt has been conquered in the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab and under the command of uh, General Amr ibn al-As and the Byzantine uh, emperor uh, tr uh, tries to and successfully reconquers Alexandria from the Muslims in the time of Uthman. So Umar conquers Alexandria. Then the Byzantine Empire launches an offensive via the ocean, via the ocean, another reason why Muawiyah wanted a naval expedition, and reconquers Alexandria. So Uthman sends the same general again to reconquer the city again. Interesting. The same general is sent, Amr ibn al-As. He's already conquered it before. He's now sent again to reconquer it. And uh, he uh, lays siege to the city, and after uh, a number of battles, and again, we don't have to go into the details, uh, Alexandria is reconquered by the Muslims, and it has remained in Muslim hands up until our times. And from, that, from then on, he then proceeds even further westward, and also southward. He goes to the lands that are called Nubia, okay, the Nubian lands, and these are lands that are now basically Sudan and underneath Sudan. And uh, he conquers very small strips, not that much more. And uh, these are basically the borders of Egypt and Sudan right now. 
Okay, we get into the borders of Egypt and Sudan, and the Muslims encounter ferocious fighting from the local Nubians, and the Nubians had a mastered a very bizarre and interesting tactic. They would target through uh, special bows and arrows, they would target the eyes of the f fighters on the other side. And they became proficient in this tactic of war. No matter what armor you're wearing, you need to have eyes open, right? And they had mastered whatever it was, special arrows and special techniques. Many Muslims became blind and lost their eyesight. And Amr ibn al-As decided after writing to Uthman that there's no point continuing down south. So they stopped. And as well, down south was not, there wasn't the wealth of civilization as, as it was up north. So the Muslims didn't feel the need to go down south anymore. And of course, that is where the map of Islam ends, right? Even to this day, South Sudan, North Sudan, even to this day, there is this uh, you know, clear divide because that's where the Muslims stopped. In the time of the Sahaba, they stopped there. And in essence, that's where the land of Islam stopped. Now, by the way, of course, there were conversions at the border. Um, you know, people, uh, traders and missionaries and whatnot, du'at are going. But by and large, where the Sahaba stopped was where Islam stopped. And therefore, even to this day, you have regions that are fully Muslim, regions that are fully Christian. And this goes back to the time of the Sahaba. So Nubia was then left other than small portions, which is now portions of Sudan. And Muslims continued westward. And they went on to what is now called uh, Libya, the countries of Libya and uh, Tunisia. And this was the region that now is going to pause and then the fitan are going to happen with Ali, with, uh, with uh, uh, Muawiyah and Ali and whatnot. Then in the time of the Umayyads, this region will spark a little bit, just a little bit. And will flare until it reaches the tip of North Africa and then goes into Europe. Okay, this is what the Umayyads most significantly did. Just a little bit of pushing at this point over here. But in the time of Uthman... Uh, not all of the tip of North Africa, but basically up until Tunisia, parts of Algeria, that's where the uh, Futuhat or the conquests uh, stopped. And then things started happening in the seat of the caliphate, in Medina, in Iraq, in Syria, that caused the conquest to basically pause. And in the time of Ali, anh, there really was no conquest at all because things were going on. And then the Umayyads, began again and there were minor conquests nothing compared to what happens in the time of the sahaba and some bits of, uh, of land here and there were conquered in the time of the abbasids by and large hardly any major conquest is done in the time of the ottomans a few interesting and significant portions most importantly constantinople istanbul but by and large and then we have one more section before salat al-isha by and large truly amazing the bulk of islamic conquests were done in the reign of the Sahaba and the early Tabi'un. And ironically, for us, not ironic, but from a purely materialistic standpoint, it makes the least amount of sense. The Sahaba, in terms of political might and training, in terms of skills, were not anywhere competitors to the civilizations of the Byzantines and the Sassanids. And for them to have done the most conquest, truly, from our perspective, is a miracle from Allah. There's no sugarcoating, there's no way around this. It is impossible to explain this in any other way. And again, I have skipped over all of these battles, but in each one of these battles, smaller groups of Muslims with lesser training, fewer arms, fewer weapons, are engaging the mightiest empires of their time. And yes, there's a lot of bloodshed. Yes, Muslims lose some battles. But by and large, the gain is absolutely phenomenal. And in these especially uh, 16 years, the 10 years of Umar and the 6 years of Uthman, these 16 years, these are the most glorious political conquests in the history of Islam. And they took place with groups of people who by and large were not even trained in the arts of war. Some of them, many of them, could not even read and write. And yet Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them, not because of their military training or lack thereof, but because they had genuine iman and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final point that we're going to do, and wallahi this deserves an entire lecture, but I've given this lecture so many times, and it's online, so I'm just going to zoom over it in 5-10 minutes. It's a very important topic. 
uh, but I've talked about it many times, and that is the biggest accomplishment of Uthman is not the military conquests. No. The biggest accomplishment of Uthman in his Khilafah is the Uthmanic Mus'haf. This is something that we shall eternally be grateful to the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan, for having done. And again, this one topic is worthy of an entire hour and a half lecture, but I have spoken about this. I've written books about Ulum al-Quran. I've given this lecture many times online in many venues. You will find it. Just a very brief summary. Uh, and if you guys want, if you insist, then it, we can also have a whole class. I don't mind, but I've done this before is the point. A brief summary, and that is that I already mentioned that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq uh, was the first person to compile a copy of the Qur'an from beginning to end. And he did this because the Qurra and the Hufad were dying. So he wanted to physically preserve the Qur'an. So we talked about that story. Now, what's happening now? The famous narration of Sahih Bukhari, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was fighting in Azerbaijan. The hadith says, in Azerbaijan. Hadith in Bukhari says he was fighting in Azerbaijan. This is 24 Hijra. And groups of Sahaba from Iraq and from Syria, groups of Muslims, not Sahaba, had joined ranks and are fighting the Azerbaijanis. And they started reciting the Quran in their camps and tents, and they're reciting the Quran differently. The Muslims from Iraq and the Muslims from Syria are reciting the Quran differently. And each one of them is saying, my Quran is better than your Quran. And my Quran is right and your Quran is wrong. And at times, some people amongst them who are not of the Sahaba, they are new converts, they might even want to get physical. They might want to, and this is common. I'm better, I'm better. And you get angry, then stand up and whatnot. Hudayfa radiallahu an sees all this. He calms them down. And he leaves the jihad on the front line. And he rushes back to Medina. He leaves the jihad because there's something more important. And he rushes back to Medina. And he says immediately, in fact, the books mention that he didn't even stop home. He literally, when he came back to Medina, in his state, he rushes into the masjid to address Uthman ibn Affan. And he says, O oh, Uthman, uh, just make sure you catch hold of this ummah before it leaves, before what happened to the Yehud and Nasara happens to it. Make sure you prevent what has happened to the Yehud and Nasara happened to the Muslims. And then he tells the whole story that I came and the Muslims are fighting about the Quran and this is not good, this is... Um, laying the foundations for dividing the ummah up into different manuscripts, different copies of the Quran. We need to have one Quran. So Uthman radiallahu an called all of the Sahaba together, the senior Sahaba, and he said, Hudayfa, tell them what you saw. Hudayfa tells the whole story, and he says, what do you think we should do? What is the solution to this? That Muslims are going to be maybe fighting over the Quran. What should be done? So one of them suggests that why don't we combine all of the Muslims on one Mus'haf? And the Sahaba unanimously agreed. What an amazing idea. And that is why, seven, eight years later, or sorry, uh, ten years later, when he was surrounded by the riffraff and the rebels, and one of the things that they criticized him for was that he burnt our Qurans. We'll get to that point. One of the Sahaba said, do not criticize Uthman for this. For wallahi, he only did this after we all unanimously agreed. All the Sahaba agreed. This isn't Uthman only. We all agreed that there should be one Mus'haf and everybody should copy from that Mus'haf. Okay? So Uthman, uh, somebody suggested this to him. Some say it was Ali and some say we don't know the name. They suggested that the Quran should be compiled into one Mus'haf. So Uthman ibn Affan called Zayd, who was the original compiler. He called Zayd and he called three other people from the Quraysh. And he said, bring me the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr. Bring me the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr. And who had the Mus'haf? Hafsa had it. How did Hafsa have it? I mentioned this before. When Abu Bakr died, it went to Umar. When Umar died, the Khalifa hadn't been decided. And so everything in the house of Umar was inherited by Hafsa. So it remained in the house of Hafsa. Nobody needed it. So when Uthman becomes Khalifa, Hafsa has the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr. 
because of this chain of events. So the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr is brought and Uthman tells them to make a specific number of copies, either four or five or six, some even say more, but most likely it was five, most likely five copies. So make five copies directly from the original, from the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr, make five copies. And he says to the team, if Zayd and you three differ about how to spell a word, let the Quraysh have the trump card over Zayd because these three are Qurashi and you are Ansari. And we are going to have now the recitation of the Quraysh. So they copied the Mus'haf five times or six or four, but Allah knows how many. And they sent each one of these to one of the major cities, uh, Kufa and Basra and Yemen. Each one is going to the major city and along with the Mus'haf, they sent a Qari. They sent somebody to recite it. And therefore, after this, the governors and the rulers were told that all copies of the Qur'an that are private must be confiscated and disposed of properly. And anybody who wants a copy should copy directly from the original. And we all know in our Sharia, the only way to dispose of something easily is by burning it. So when the command came to burn the Qur'an, one needs to understand in the non-Muslim mind, you burn a book because you disrespect it. And in our minds, we burn the Qur'an because we respect it and we don't want to throw it in the garbage. So we respect it by incinerating it. We need to understand the cultural paradigm. When Muslims say Uthman ordered the Qur'an to be burned, this is like you go in front of a, a protest and you burn something in our country. Right? You burn the book, you burn an effigy, you burn the flag, then this is a demonstration that you're hating something. Right? This is our culture or the Western culture. In the Muslim and Arab culture, burning the Quran is not disrespecting it. It is in fact respecting it. We need to understand the mentality difference that non-Muslims when they read this point. So Uthman radiallahu an commanded all of the Mus'hafs to be gathered up and then incinerated, and then anybody who wants to copy the Qur'an should get it directly from the master copy that he himself has commissioned. Now, because of this, alhamdulillah, we thank Allah Azza wa Jal that our ummah has never differed over the Qur'an. <clears throat> no matter what your sect or group, no matter where you're coming from, and the irony, even the group that doesn't like Uthman is following his Qur'an. The irony of ironies. Even the group that does not like Uthman ibn Affan, their Qur'ans and their Mus'hafs are the Mus'haf of Uthman ibn Affan. And this is the beauty of preserving the Qur'an. Even the groups that don't agree with many things, Alhamdulillah, we have one copy of the Qur'an and that is universal across the Muslim glo uh, globe. And Alhamdulillah, we don't have various recensions and versions and differences that the other groups do. Now the big question which we don't have time to get into which is really the matter of a lot of confusion, and it is more to do with the sciences of the Qur'an than with history. The big question that everybody asks, what were these differences? And how come the Muslims of Iraq were reciting differently than the Muslims of Syria? And what is this notion of the language of the Quraysh? So this whole issue, the fact of the matter is, it's not related to the Caliphate of Uthman directly. This goes to another topic, related to the sciences of the Qur'an, the ulum al-Qur'an, and it goes back to something called the ahruf, or the modes of recitation. And our Prophet ﷺ said the Qur'an has been revealed in multiple ahruf, seven ahruf. And I'll be very, very simplistic, uh, and subhanAllah, much can be said. In the end of the day, nobody knows for sure, because we don't have the other ahruf anymore. They're gone. Nobody knows for sure. But what seems to be the case was that in early Islam, when the Quran was being revealed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in all of the dialects of the major Arab tribes. So that somebody from Kinda or Hawazin or the Taghlab or any of the tribes would be able to recite the Quran in a vocabulary and a language. This is from the Prophet that they are more used to. Realize Arabic had not been standardized. And even now, if you look, listen to some accents of, of Arabic, they are radically different than other accents of Arabic. Okay? The Arabic of the Syrians is not like the Arabic of the Yemenis. 
And as for the Arabic of the Moroccans, I don't even consider Arabic with my respect to the Moroccans and the Algerians, right? But that's besides the point. So there's various differences even to this day. In those days, it was even more pronounced of a difference, even more pronounced, because language has not been standardized. There are no printed books. These are geographic regions. So what appears to be the case, Allah revealed the Quran simultaneously in these dialects. And so the Sahaba memorized it in their dialects and they go to their lands. So the new Muslims, the Tabi'un, Taba Tabi'un, they learn the Quran in the dialect that Allah revealed it to that particular tribe. Now, in each region, that's fine. What's going to happen when they meet with one another? This is what happened in Azerbaijan. And these new converts didn't understand the original. The Sahaba didn't fight. They know what's going on. They didn't understand what's going on. And they felt, oh, I heard this from this Sahabi. And the other one said, I heard it from that Sahabi. No, no, mine is right, yours is wrong. So the purpose of revealing in multiple ahruf is gone now. That was in early Islam. So what appears to be the case, and this is the position of Ibn Abdul Bar and Tabari, and, and it seems to be Wallahi, the strongest one now, uh, if you look back at it. Uthman radiallahu an understood that the wisdom of having multiple ahruf no longer is needed. We are now the dominant superpower. We don't need to have dialects. Let's go back to the dialect of the Quraysh, the Asl. And let's eliminate the other dialects. Let's eliminate everything else. We have no need of them anymore. And in essence, they're the same thing. It's just how you recite it, how you pronounce it. You might have a synonym word. So we know, for example, in one ahruf, uh, in, instead of kal-ihn al-manfush, kal-suf al-manfush. Okay, ihn is suf and these days, modern Arabs know Suf and they don't know Ihn. Okay, but the Quraysh, Quraysh would call it Ihn. Kal Ihn al Manfush. And Ihn is Suf. Kal Suf al Manfush is one of the Ahruf. Okay, so that's actually a difference in Ahruf. A different word is used. We no longer say Kal Suf al Manfush, do we? We say Kal Ihn al Manfush. But in one of the Ahruf, it was Kal Suf al Manfush. So clearly, there were differences. Now, all of these are coming from the Prophet. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed it. So Uthman understood there's no need. So he eliminated all of the other ahruf, and alhamdulillah, he united the ummah on the mushaf, which is in the dialect of the Quraysh, which is the original of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the sahaba all agreed to this, and therefore, there has never been any controversy in our history. There was a slight controversy in the time of Uthman, slight, and that's it, it was gone. And alhamdulillah, the ummah has never differed uh, uh, up until our times. And the copies of Uthman's mushafs remain for many, many centuries. But as with all things, eventually nothing lasts forever other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al-baqi. Everything else goes. Kullu man alayha fan. And these manuscripts as well eventually faded away. How long will leather last? They were written on leather. They were written on camel leather. And how long will camel leather last? The fact of the matter Contrary to what many of you believe, we do not have any of the Uthmanic Mus'hafs in our times. It would not be even humanly possible to retain them unless they were kept in a vacuum for hundreds of years. And that was not done. Over time, they eventually faded out, were worn out. Over time, we know for a fact one or two of them were destroyed in medieval fires. In 800, 900 year, uh, Hijra, fires took place in this masjid, that masjid, and the libraries went down. And in that library was one of the copies, for example. So, we do not have any of those original Uthmanic mushafs anymore. What you see in top copy, the pictures you see of other mushafs, these are old mushafs, but they are not Uthmanic mushafs. These go back maybe even to the first century, but they are not Uthmanic mushafs. And all you need to do is look at the script. The script that is used is ancient Kufic script. Uthman did not write an ancient Kufic script. Think about it. Kufa is not what the people of Medina used. The most ancient mushafs that most of you see uh, the folios of is written in ancient Kufic strip. This is early Umayyad. This is early Umayyad, if at best. Now, we do have some pages of the Quran that date back to the time of the Sahaba. Fragments, not full copies. And this is what is logical. The full copy is going to fade away. But you have half a page here, some pages there. And recently, you know, there was a carbon-14 dating that was done on, on a manuscript at the University of Birmingham. And it was 
authentically dated back to the era of uh, the Sahaba, 30 or 40 Hijrah. So this is right after Uthman's time, and it's a very early time frame. Uh, as for the original Mus'hafs of Uthman, we no longer have them. The earliest complete Mus'hafs we have really date back to uh, the end of the first and the beginning of the second century. The beginning of the second century. And the famous Samarqand Mus'haf, and I have a facsimile copy of it at home. Maybe I should, I, should, I should have bought it. I didn't think of it. I have a copy of the Samarqand Mus'haf at home, a facsimile copy of it. The Samarqand Mus'haf, which is probably the most famous um, one, uh, and the top copy one is the second most famous one. If you just look at it, you will see there are markings, there are ayat endings. The script of it does not date to the time of Uthman. It dates to the early Umayyad uh, timings. So these are ancient mushafs that definitely date back to uh, the era of maybe Al-Hajjaj or somebody of this nature, but definitely not to the era of Uthman ibn Affan. Nonetheless, we do have pages and fragments from the time of the Sahaba. And most importantly, even if we don't have the original Uthmanic, the point is all of these ancient mushafs conform with one another. All of them overlap. All of them are helping one another. There's no variations in them, which clearly proves, alhamdulillah, that inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. And this is the greatest blessing that uh, Uthman ibn Affan gave to the Ummah by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unify the Ummah upon a Mus'haf. And that is why the Mus'haf is called Mus'haf Uthman. The Mus'haf is called Mus'haf Uthman as an honor to him. And indeed, it is the greatest honor that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal bestowed upon Uthman to allow him to be the protector of the uh, holy book. Inshallah ta'ala with that, next Wednesday we'll begin the very, very difficult and awkward uh, topic of the assassination of Uthman. And it's a sad tragedy, which is the beginning of the fitna uh, of between the Sahaba. We'll begin this, inshallah ta'ala, next uh, Wednesday. Any quick questions before we break for today? Yes. Unfortunately, I am more academically inclined and I don't just believe in tales of this nature. Unfortunately or fortunately, I can't. Um, yes, this is what I had heard growing up. These are the fables and legends we love to hear. But it simply goes against facts. The, the claim that the original that Uthman was reading and his bloodstains are still there. I mean, what can I say? I can... <laughs> It's just not something that is believable. And if you go to Topkapi Museum, and I've been there three times, the museum, uh, and you walk into that room, firstly, the entire selection of items there. Before you see the Mus'haf Uthman, you will see, mashallah, tabarakallah, the bow and arrow of Sulaiman. Before that, you will see the actual staff of Musa, that he used to open up the, the sea with. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Okay? And you will see the shroud of I don't know what, and you will see. So if you believe all of that, then the next in line is this as well. Okay? So, I mean, yani, I find it awkward to mention these types of things, but this is the reality. Uh, and then you will see the actual cloak of the Prophet, which very strangely resembles the cloak of a noble Turkish man. Of 16th century. I mean, again, you know, it's like... And then when you look at the Uthmanic Mus'haf, the alleged Uthmanic Mus'haf, again, you just have to have a basic knowledge of manuscripts and writings, which alhamdulillah I do. A very ba You don't have to have to be an expert. The script, the parchment, the, the writings on it, the nuqat and tashkil, which, okay, they were added on later. Nonetheless, so the writing style... The fact that you have the markings at the end of the ayat in a certain way, this is not from the Sahaba. That's all. You just have to have, I would say, an undergraduate knowledge. And that's basically all that I have of makhtutat and, and writing. I'm not an expert, but I have that basic knowledge. You just look at it and you know this is not. The Sahaba wrote in a script that is called Khat al-Ma'il, Ma'il script. And there are 
some manuscripts, pages of them, that are in Ma'il manuscript. This is what the Sahaba wrote in. The Sahaba, Uthman ibn Affan, did not write in Kufic script. Kufic script was not invented in 25 Hijrah, that they would be writing in Kufic script, right? So the notion that, and also, I mean, you know, you're a doctor. How long does leather last? I mean, you tell me, how long is the leather skin going to last? Given the fact that this was preserved, not in any museum, not in a vacuum, it was preserved in the moistest conditions, in the hottest conditions, it was taken from desert to storm to this and that, it was transported by camel. How long is it going to last, right? You tell me. So, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot, I know, wallahi, the Muslims love to hear these things. If I said this to you, I know it wouldn't be true, and that's not me. Just look at the artifacts yourself and use your common sense to, to, to judge them. Simple as that, okay? That's all I can say. And we don't, alhamdulillah, we don't need the original Uthmanic anymore. That's the point. We don't need it. The very fact that the entire ummah has agreed on the Qur'an clearly demonstrates there was one asl that everybody's coming from, right? So, and, and another point, I have to mention this again. The main method of preserving the Qur'an is not via the book anyway. It's via hifz. You don't even need the book. Yani if somehow the entire mushafs of the world cease to exist, every city of the world would be able to write the mushaf itself, correct? Even here in small little town of Memphis, how many Muslims are there compared to the rest of the ummah? How many hufal do we have? All of us hufal could come together. Hafiz Sahib is here, another Hafiz Sahib there, I'm a Hafiz Sahib. All Hafiz come together. We will be able to write the Qur'an from our own hifz. I mean, this is how the Qur'an is preserved. So when Muslims are taught these types of stories, then they find out it's not true. Wallahi, the problem is in us that we had to teach them these fables in the first place, right? So that's why I am somebody who's very, very cautious. You know when you build your faith on shaky foundations, you are calling into account the faith itself. And that's our problem. That's why you hear me speak and I try my best. That's why even about the seerah of the Prophet to portray him as a human, wallahi, it is better in the long run. Because when you read the seerah, he is a human, sallallahu alayhi wa To make him superhuman, then you read the seerah, then your own iman will come into doubt. Because the image you made is not the image found in the seerah. Which is why it's better to be honest and, and speak the truth about these issues. The same goes for the preservation of the Qur'an. The original Uthmanic, we don't need it and it's not there. And we haven't had it for the longest time. For centuries we haven't had the original. And we would, I mean, again, do your research. How long does a leather parchment last? It doesn't last more than a few centuries. So do we really think for 14 and a half centuries the entire bulky mushaf would still be around? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. So uh, that's the reality. No, there is no original mushaf. There is no blood of Uthman in the top copy manuscript. There will be smudges there. And if you want to read in that that's blood, that's your prerogative. But it is not the blood of Uthman in those manuscripts. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Sorry to disappoint you, but... That is what I have to do when it comes to the truth. Inshallah, we'll continue next uh, Wednesday. Inshallah, Zakalafaris.